eight o'clock on a uh, federal on a national holiday to listen to the selection. <laughs> And also that we really, we really appreciate Dr. Hayes getting up at eight o'clock on a national holiday to give us this lecture. My pleasure. Okay, Kevin, we are ready for you. Incredible, awesome. So hello everyone, welcome to our guest lecture. I'm super excited to introduce um, our guest lecturer today, Dr. Tyrone B. Hayes. Uh, to give a little bit of background about um, Dr. Hayes, um, Dr. Hayes was born in Columbia, South Carolina and um, graduated from Dreher High School in 1985 and earned a BA and MA degrees in biology from Harvard University. He wrote his dissertation about genetic and environmental mechanisms that determine the gender of wood frogs. He is an advocate for critical review and regulation of pesticides, as well as other chemicals that may cause adverse side effects. And he's presented hundreds of papers, talks, and seminars um, about environmental chemical contaminants that played a role in global amphibian declines and health disparities. Uh, most prominently, Dr. Hayes is known in his research into atrazine as an endocrine disruptor um, and is, um, Yes, yeah, just a phenomenal all around person. And I won't steal too much away from your guest lecture today, uh, Dr. Hayes. So I'll let you take it away for the rest of it. Thank you. If I can just share a screen here. There we go. Oops. Does everybody have, can everybody see the screen now? So here's a title I like to use in Silent Spring, The Silent Night. Um, I'll, I'll explain the title later. And it's my just my typical, my normal research talk. Um, but there's been a lot of interest in what it means to be a scientist, a person of color and a scientist. So it's my normal research talk, but I have incorporated into the talk moments when I can talk about what it means to be a black scientist. And, and of course, science is science. You know, there's such a thing as the color of science. But I think that the way we experience science and the way that we experience academia is greatly affected by how we present and who we are. And, and so I'll use this opportunity to address that today. Before I start, I, I wanna start with this phrase that I learned during my work in Southern Africa. And I won't try to pronounce it closer. It's a Bantu proverb, but loosely translated means people are people through other people. In other words, we are the sum of our interactions and our relationships with people. And, and we hold responsibility to them. So I never present myself or my work without first presenting the people who have made me who I am, the people who've had the biggest impacts on my life. And first and foremost is, is my family, um, most of us here in South Carolina, um, but especially my mom and my dad, Romeo and Sue Hayes, for their love and support over my 54 years on this planet. And also to my wife, Catherine Kim, and my son and my daughter, Tyler and Christina, for their love and support. I want to also acknowledge the funding sources. They have been funded by the uh, chemical pharmaceutical industry, but not anymore. So this is also a matter of my disclosure. We'll talk about that as well. And I also wanna thank all of the students that have been involved in my work and everybody in blue here is an undergraduate. I had a wonderful experience as an undergraduate myself and I've been doing my best trying to give that back. And in fact, Anne Narayan, one of the names you'll see there I met through SSP. I gave a lecture one summer and she came to Berkeley, ended up working in my lab and publishing some very important um, work from my laboratory. And, and these are just the students over the years. And I also want to acknowledge um, the wonderful diversity of students that I've had the um, opportunity to work with in my 30 years at Berkeley. Um, in addition to every kind of diversity you can imagine, I've also had the opportunity to work with students whose families have worked in the agricultural industry. And it's given me a whole new perspective to be studying chemicals that are used in our food and to have students working with me who say, wow, my parents were sprayed with this. And finally, I wanna dedicate this to my uh, grandmother who was like a third parent to me. In addition to passing on her love of education and her desire to make the world a better place to me, she also taught me something that you can't learn at fancy places like Harvard and Berkeley. And that is, if you want to get a point across, don't preach, don't teach, just tell a good story. 
And so that, that's what I view my job today is to just tell you a good story. And, and my story will start and end with a little boy who likes frogs. My mom sent me this book when my son was born. I don't remember the book, but my mom says it was my favorite book. And, but what I remember is that I've been in love with amphibians and I've been trying to answer this question, what is a frog for as long as I can remember? And that love started here. This was my grandmother's house, this house, my, a lot of history in that house relevant to what it means to be black in academia. Um, my grandmother's grandfather built that house here in South Carolina. My grandmother was born in that house. My mother was born in that house. And in fact, when my grandmother died, the bill of sale for her grandmother, who was born a slave, was still in that house. And so it has had incredible meaning for me. Um, relevant to my story today, the other meaning that this house has for me is that this is where I fell in love with Amphibia. My parents used to drop us off on the weekend to spend the weekend with my grandmother. And we, she had a huge forest behind her house. And we would get lost. Okay, so she wasn't the babysitter, best babysitter, but we would get lost in that forest for hours and hours and hours. And there were birds and there were reptiles and there were mammals. Um, to give you an idea though, so here's, here's, here's the house. So this is a recent Google Earth picture. And here's that huge forest that I thought was like the Amazon. It was just this tiny, tiny little speck of forest. But what was in that forest, in addition to the reptiles and the mammals, et cetera, were amphibians, these guys. And, and this is what I fell in love with. And I fell in love with amphibians because they had a magic that happened in birds and mammals, but a magic that you could only see in amphibians. So for example, even development in a bird or mammal occurs inside, you can't see it. If you're, you know, there's things going on behind the eggshell, but you can't see them. Amphibians have no eggshell, they have no placenta. And so I could watch eggs develop. So this is an egg, you can see there's more cells now coming as the egg divides further. Here's a few hours later, few hours later, a few more hours and every single of these, one of these dimples is a cell. So this single cell has divided and divided and divided. And then it turns into a living, swimming, breathing organism. It goes through gastrulation and neurulation, just like we do. And it, it, it turns into this independently living organism. But then it does something magical that other animals don't do. It transforms into a completely new organism. I mean, it, you know, the tail goes away and it grows legs and the gills go away and it grows lungs and you can watch all of that happening. That's what fascinated me. What also fascinated me was how do all these parts know what the other parts are doing? For example, if the tail went away before it had legs, it'd be a little ball that couldn't move. If the gills went away before it had lungs, it wouldn't be able to breathe. So somehow these parts know what the other parts are doing. The other thing that fascinated me from the time I was a child <clears throat> was how do you coordinate these parts with the world around you? In other words, if you metamorphose too early, if you turn into a frog too early, you'd be too small and you couldn't find food. If you took too long to metamorphose, the pond might dry up and then you'd die from, from desiccation. And it turns out that all of these parts are coordinated by hormones. There are hormones that turn all the tadpole genes off and turn a new set of genes on to build a frog. It also turns out that the parts are coordinated with the environment through these same hormones. As the pond starts to dry up, it triggers the hormones that stimulate the transformation. And I didn't notice until I was in college, but the ability of hormones to both control the genes in an organism and the ability of the environment to control these hormones is what fascinated me and stimulated my career. In fact, here I am at age 19, so we skipped a few years, and I got the opportunity as an undergraduate to find out what it, what it means to do real research, to do real science, the kind of thing that I've been trying to do in grade school and high school throughout my time in South Carolina. Um, if it wasn't for this man who just believed in me as a scientist, I don't know that I ever would have finished Harvard. I think for, at the time that I was there, it was 16% non-white. So there were very few black, very, very few people of color um, were students then in 1985. Um, but one of the two things got me through. One was the support of this professor, and the other one was the woman who would become my wife, um, her love and support. One of the other things that I dreamed about as a child was going to Africa. 
And, and, and it was truly a dream come true. I got to go there as a graduate student once I moved to Berkeley. So again, we skipped a few years. And not only did I get to go to Africa, but National Geographic paid for it. And because my, that's significant because my dream had been stimulated through National Geographic all my life. I remember folding out the maps and folding out the pages and dreaming of going to Africa uh, through these National Geographic magazines for as long as I can remember. And now, not only did I get to go, I got to be in the magazine, I got to be on the show, and I really got to become, in the truest sense of dream come true, I got to become that guy that I dreamed about as a little kid. I worked in Africa initially in a place called the Arabuku Sukoke, and it's along the coast here in, in, in Kenya. And it was in the Arabuku Sukoke that I discovered a frog where the males and the females look completely different from each other. They look like they could be different species. And I became interested in what's happening in the environment. What are males and females in this species, Hyperolis argus? What are they doing differently that requires one to be one color and then another, and, and the other sex, another color? But I also started to wonder how do they get to be differently colored? And we brought some back to the lab in, in, in California, and we found out that all of the animals in the species start out green. And then the females change color at sexual maturity. So we hypothesized that this was a hormone driven process. We hypothesized that estrogen from the female caused the color change. And we tested that in the lab by literally just dipping frogs in hormone solutions. Okay? And if you dip them in estrogen, estradiol is an example, it will change color, which supported our hypothesis. What's more, as we show that if you dip them in ethanol estradiol, this is a synthetic estrogen used in birth control pill. They'll change color. If you dip them in DES, another pharmaceutical estrogen, they'll change color. And if you dip them in DDT, an insecticide that just happens to bind the estrogen receptor and behave like an estrogen, they'll change color. What was significant is that we tested dozens of compounds and we found out that every estrogen that made my frog change color was also known to promote breast cancer. We also found out that we could block the color change with chemicals like tamoxifen. This is a breast cancer treatment, a drug treatment for breast cancer that blocks the estrogen receptor that stops your cancerous cells from dividing. So not only could we identify compounds that might promote breast cancer by using, by dipping my little frog, we also potentially could identify compounds that might be used in the treatment of breast cancers, so-called estrogen blockers. And so we filed a patent. So I, I actually had a patent on this frog, on using this frog, on dipping this frog in solutions as a potential breast cancer detection test. Now, things changed a little bit for me once we filed the patent because the, the process that, that we developed um, became the intellectual property of the university, which then once you hold the patent, they require that you show that you're gonna monetize or make money on the process that you filed the patent for. So we had to find a customer. So we were approached by Novartis, um, at the time, the largest chemical company in the world. And they asked us, could we use frogs to test atrazine and determine if it was a so-called endocrine disruptor? Does it interfere with hormones that are relevant to humans? So here's atrazine, it's a so-called S-chlorotriazine. We accepted the, the, the proposal, obviously. Atrazine is an herbicide or weed killer, mostly used on corn in this country. It's used since 1958. We use 80 million pounds annually in the United States. At the time, it was the number one selling agrochemical in the world. It's used in more than 80 countries, so it's, it's worldwide use, but it's now outlawed in all of Europe. And I, and I bring that up only because the company's based in Europe. So we're using 80 million pounds of a chemical that's not allowed in the, on the continent that the company calls home. We tested the compound on another, on another African frog, the African clawed frog. Um, this is a very commonly used frog in, in, in research um, for an odd reason. It turns out in 1920, somebody discovered that the human pregnancy hormone, HCG, will make this frog lay eggs. So this frog literally from night until about 1940, this frog was the pregnancy test. If you thought you were pregnant, you would go to the doctor, they would inject some urine into the frog, and if it laid eggs, then you were pregnant. And I tell this story for a couple of reasons. Um, one is it shows the value of, 
basic research, right? Like somehow, for some reason, somebody in 1920 just, just wondered, what will happen if I inject pee into a frog? I have no idea what the hypothesis is, but the outcome was very important. As I said, this became a pregnancy test. I tell the story because it also shows, like with my frog, that our hormones, human hormones, are so similar to frog hormones that studies in frogs will tell us something about humans and vice versa. And that'll be one of the, the main points of my talk today. So if you don't care about frogs, when I tell you what atrazine does to the frog, then you should be thinking about people, which is what we'll end up talking about. I guess the only other significance of the African clawed frog is that once new pregnancy tests were developed, people just threw them out. So actually my African clawed frogs that I use in my lab come from San Diego. <laughs> so technically they're African-American clawed frogs. I collect them there because we don't have to pay the price that these companies charge. So what I found out in my African-American clawed frogs is that if you expose them to atrazine, it inhibited growth of the voice box or the larynx and, and the exposed males. And, and this is significant because male frogs sing and female frogs don't for the same reason that in general, human men have deeper voices than women, testosterone. So these data suggested that testosterone was somehow blocked in these animals. So of course, if there's a problem with testosterone, you, you go to the gonads. Um, these are frog gonads, which you're probably not familiar with. You'll see more frog gonads in this talk than you probably will in the rest of your life. But you won't see many that look like this because this is an animal with testis. So those are testis at the top. But then this animal has ovaries, then it has more testis, then it has ovaries. And despite what you may have learned from Jurassic Park, frogs are not naturally hermaphroditic. The testis and the ovaries should be in separate individuals. So we hypothesized that the following was happening. Regardless of whether or not you're a frog, a cat, a fish, a dog, or a human, if you have a testis, it should make testosterone. In fact, the word testosterone is a portmanteau. It means testicular hormone. So it is, quote, the male hormone. And we hypothesized that atrazine turned on an enzyme that converts testosterone into estrogen. Also a portmanteau. Estrogen means the generator of estrus. So it is, quote, the female hormone. So our hypothesis was that atrazine causes a reduction in testosterone because it's being converted into estrogen. And then if you're an exposed genetic male, you're now making the female hormone when you shouldn't. We tested that and showed that indeed testosterone levels are reduced in atrazine exposed males, as, as you can see here. And, and, and so that the atrazine exposed males are not significantly different from control females. Having support for those data, we published a paper. And at this time I was coming up for tenure. Some of you know about tenure. And we published this paper hermaphroditic demasculinized frogs after exposure to the herbicide atrazine at low ecologically relevant doses. We published it in PNAS, Proceedings to the National Academy of Sciences, which is a you know, big deal for somebody who's coming up for tenure. I mean, I did other stuff, but this paper definitely didn't hurt. Um, I remember though, my mom calling me after the paper was published and saying, how important is this? I went to Barnes and Noble, they never heard of this magazine. <laughs> and it makes me think very differently about what we do in the ivory tower and what's important in the real world versus what's important in the, in, in the academic world. And I'll have more to say about that at the end. As important as the paper was, and by the way, four black men in Latina co-authored this paper. It's probably a record for the National Academy. Um, and as important as it was, however, we didn't know still if these hermaphrodites were males with ovaries or females with testes because we didn't know the genetic constitution. Frogs don't have sex chromosomes. So visible sex chromosomes anyway. We also didn't know what happens when they become adults. So are these hermaphrodites permanently hermaphrodites or do they become males? Do they eventually become females? Um, and that's a difficult question to answer because it takes about five years for these frogs to become sexually mature. In fact, it took us about eight years to solve the problem. And we solved it, we published it in another PNAS paper. And, and here's the answer. By the time the paper came out, some genes had been identified in this species. So we could do PCR and, and determine genetically who's a female. So females have this gene called DMW that genetic males don't have. And, and what's shown in this bottom photograph is that we could prove that this guy was a male. But we could also prove that his partner is also genetically male. So this is a genetically male frog that behaves like a female, looks like a female, lays eggs like a, like a female, 
And in fact, one of the most exciting thing is the eggs that were published in our second PNAS paper. We're now about to publish a paper on the great, great, great grandchildren of the eggs shown in this photograph. So that's, that's pretty exciting for me. In addition to showing that atrazine could completely convert some of the genetic males into females, about 10% completely became females. We also studied what happened to the resistant genetic males, the ones that didn't grow ovaries, but were raised in atrazine. We decided to ask, what does their fertility look like? And we did that again in a very simple assay where we bred frogs, atrazine exposed or not exposed. And then we calculated fertility based on how many of the eggs were unfertilized. So that's an unfertilized egg in the top left versus how many eggs started to develop. So that's how we essentially measured sperm count. And, and we showed that fertility is severely impaired in atrazine exposed males. So control males fertilize about 85% of a female's eggs, atrazine treated males only about 15%. And we showed that that's because they don't show male typical behavior. So they don't actually copulate with the female. But even if they did, if you examine the test that's under the microscope, you find that controls have testicular tubules that are full of sperm. That's what all that dark purple staining is there. Whereas atrazine treated testicular tubules have cellular debris and very few sperm. So they don't have enough testosterone to maintain male reproductive behavior. And even if they did, they don't have enough testosterone to maintain sperm. So we published a, uh, another paper. Atrazine induces complete feminization and chemical castration in male African clawed frogs. Three significant things about this paper. One is the company hates the term chemical castration. That's why I put it in the title. Two, there were nine undergraduates involved in the project. Every one of them now has either a PhD or an MD or both. And in addition, you'll see the name Anne Narayan here, the third author. She was a student that I originally met at SSP at a talk just like this one, except that was live and in person, who went on to um, undergraduate at Berkeley, worked in my laboratory, earned co-authorship on this paper, and has long since completed her MD degree. So I'm equally proud of all of those events. So here's what's going on in my lab now. Extensions of that work is, this is a figure that shows all of these animals are genetic males. There's about 10,000 sample size in this figure. Um, they're all genetic males. Blue means they had testes. Red means that they had ovaries after exposure to estrogen. And so what this paper shows is in blue are all the animals that, or all the families, I guess, that didn't respond to estrogen. And on in the red now, the ones that had a statistically significant response to estrogen. What's important is the animals that you buy from these commercial sources to do science essentially don't respond to estrogen, right? So their offspring, you'll see here, 95% of them develop testes, even though they were bathed in estrogen all of their lives, compared to the wild of feral populations where, again, on, on this end of the extreme, these animals are all genetic male, genetically male, when exposed to estrogen, 100% of them grew ovaries instead of testes, even though they were genetically male. So there's incredible variability and sensitivity to estrogen. And my graduate students now are trying to figure out the molecular mechanism that underlies this difference. This might explain, for example, why some women are more likely to get breast cancer than other women. So the same kinds of um, um, differences in response in, in humans might also be present in frogs. The other thing that we've done is this is a map, all the red dots show all the places that I've gone over the country to both measure atrazine in the water um, and also to measure reproductive abnormalities. So we're trying to track in the real world if reproductive abnormalities are associated with atrazine contamination. One last study we're doing is in a place that I can't disclose, but we're collecting frogs from this arrow and from these white arrows. And this is a, a, a river. And, and the difference between the red arrows and the white arrows is this red outline is a golf course that uses an incredible amount of atrazine year round. So we're studying frogs above the golf course and then asking what happens to the frog populations that, that live below the golf course. And we're getting some interesting answers. So the red here is above the golf course and these are testosterone levels that are much higher than the animals that are living downstream of the golf course. So we're getting a, a, a real picture of how this stuff impacts amphibians in the real world. And finally, the reason that I'm here and speaking to you from South Carolina now is it turns out that swamp that I played in as a kid, one of the swamps that I played in 
is now a national park, the only national park in South Carolina. And a few years ago, it turns out though, it was discovered that chemicals and medicines, this is a news article, um, tainting Congaree National Park waters. And it turns out the chemicals that are contaminating the national park are atrazine, the herbicide that I study, and ethanyl estradiol, the estrogen that I told you that's in birth control pill. So the river brings its agricultural chemical through the park and the leaky septic tanks from the low income black community that lives around the national park are leaking birth control pill or ethanyl estradiol into the water. The news article, if you had read it a few years ago, focused on these guys, you know, what happens when, you know, the vacationers come through and fall in the water and get exposed to these chemicals. What I was excited or interested in though is, one, it shows that the park has no boundaries. What about the frogs that live in the park that are supposed to be protected? How is atrazine and ethanyl estradiol affecting the frogs? But also, what is the impact on the low-income Black community that live there, not on the people that come there just to recreate in the park? So we've had an ongoing study for approximately 10 years. I always joke about the hood to Harvard. Now we get to bring Harvard back to the hood. My students get to come back with me. So this is a former student, Karen Zhang, who was sampling with me a few years ago. So it's really been great for me to be able to give back to, to the community that got me interested in biology in the first place. Um, the other thing that was, that's was that been interesting for me as a black scientist was being able to work in Africa. Um, you know, a lot to unpackage there, which we can talk about after the talk, but I got to work in places like Uganda. Um, and in this case, I use this photo to show this is at a place called Lake Nabugabu. And the runoff from this crop, I don't know if they're using chemicals or not, but whether or not they are, that water then becomes the sole source of drinking and cooking water for this village. And I use this slide to illustrate that even though I've been talking about frogs, this is also a human related issue. We live in the environment as well. So the oneness of environmental health and public health, I think is made clear here, where if there's anything running off this crop that would affect the fish and the frogs in this pond, that same water that's affecting the fish and the frogs is being used by humans, which use the same hormones that we do. So if there's an endocrine disruptor in the frogs and fish, we're also exposed. We just don't see that connection in, in the kinds of villages that we live in now. So this is Oakland where I live, my house is somewhere here, but my water just comes from these reservoirs. And I think we have this mindset that, well, the Environmental Protection Agency, you know, these agencies wouldn't let anything bad in my water, but all you have to do is talk to somebody from Flint, Michigan to know that that's not necessarily the case. So the reason I call this from Silent Spring to Silent Night, is because Rachel Carson taught in Silent Spring that the death of birds and the role that pesticides were playing in the death of birds was a warning to us. Our Silent Spring was a warning to us. In much the same way, I think that the effects that we're seeing in frogs and our Silent Night is also a warning to us. I say Silent Night because you may or may not know that 80% of all amphibians worldwide are in decline or in threatened of, of threatened with um, enda being endangered or extinct at some level. And so our pending silent night, I would argue, our loss of amphibians is as much a warning to us as the loss of birds was. I'm not gonna tell you that atrazine is the cause for amphibian decline. I'm not even gonna tell you that environmental pollutants are the cause for endocrine, uh, from amphibian decline. The main cause is habitat loss. Okay, so pot water is being moved around and used for agriculture, for example, in California. But when the only water you have to breed in is filled with agriculture runoff and you're faced with pathogens, introduced pathogens, um, atmospheric change, such as climate change and invasive species, the chemicals in that water would have a big impact on your likelihood of surviving. To further uh, shamelessly give you the idea of how studying frogs could tell you something about humans, this is an excerpt from a book. The author saying, I remembered the Hayes lab. So the author worked in my lab at the University of California, Berkeley. This is a medical doctor who studies crowding and stress in children and especially in black and Latino, Latinx children um, and, and how overcrowding and stress affects their health. And so she's saying as she was trying to figure out how overcrowding and stress affects these young people, she says, when I was 20 years old, I logged some serious hours there and frogs were a big part of it. The Hayes lab was an amphibian research lab 
where the imminent Dr. Hayes was studying the effects of corticoids, stress hormones, and tadpoles. The ghost of research past flooded my brain. The point that she's making in this talk is at the time we were studying overcrowding and tadpoles and how that affected their health. And she used our model to try to understand how overcrowding affects human health and how stress hormones might be involved. And this is the author Nadine Burke Harris. Um, and this is her book. And, and I'm bragging because she went on to become California's first ever uh, state surgeon general. And, and her ideas that she became famous for were ideas that she extrapolated from her work on tadpoles in my lab. And she now uses that and applies that to people. So in much the same way, I think that our work in frogs also applies to people with regards to atrazine. This is a quote from a colleague of mine that said, in echoepidemiology, the occurrence of an association in more than one species and species population is very strong evidence for causation. So I've shown you evidence from multiple actually phylogenetic families of frogs. But what I'm gonna tell you today is that the type of effects that I discovered in amphibians have now been discovered in every vertebrate class that's been examined and applied directly to the human condition. That's to be expected a little bit. If you're interested in the molecular biology, you can talk about that later. But it turns out that atrazine has these effects because it binds to a compound called phosphodiesterase in the cells of the gonads of these frogs. And that ultimately leads to the induction and greater expression of the gene for the enzyme that converts testosterone into estrogen. Now, I bring this up now because estrogen is regulated on the molecular level in the exact same way from fish to amphibians to reptiles to birds to mammals. So if we see this type of effect, this binding of phosphodiesterase in amphibians, then you would expect to see it in every animal that's been exposed, including humans. And we went on to show that. I published a paper called Demasculization and Feminization of Male Gonads by Atrazine, Consistent Effects Across Vertebrate Classes. And I published this with 22 co-authors, 22 other scientists from 12 different countries. So the thing that we discovered was now being discovered all over the world. So for example, here's amphibians, eggs in the, I mean, a sperm in the testis, give it atrazine, no sperm. This is a guy in Belgium who showed the same thing in fish. This is a couple in Argentina who showed the same thing in Cayman, they're, they're reptiles of like an uh, alligator. This is a group in um, Croatia and Nigeria that independently showed, this is sperm in the testis, testicular tubule of a rat, give it atrazine, no sperm. And then this is a guy in Pakistan who discovered the same thing in quail and birds. So this effect wasn't just restricted to frogs. And I have to admit, the main reason that I combined with everybody to publish this paper is because the company was targeting me saying, oh, there's nothing wrong with atrazine. It's just some crazy guy, Berkeley and frogs. And, and the point of this paper was to show, no, it's not just my work and it's not just frogs. It's been discovered all over the world. So did sperm count go down because testosterone's going down? That's been shown in fish. This is a research group in England. There's work from my frogs that I already showed you. And here's work in rats, which are mammals, of course, like us. In humans, we can't do experiments, but my colleague Shana Swan showed that if you measure atrazine in the urine of men, and this was done in Columbia, Missouri, that there's a statistically significant correlation. Men who have about 0.1 parts per billion atrazine in their urine tend to have a very low sperm count and very low fertility. Now, what I haven't told you is that 0.1 parts per billion is the level that we're using in my laboratory. So if you have enough atrazine in your urine to chemically castrate a frog or a fish, then you also tend to have a low sperm count yourself. So again, it's just a correlation, but I think very strong indication. Another study showed, and I've, I've squashed down the data here, um, but another study showed that here are atrazine levels in field workers, and here I've squashed down the data, because here are atrazine levels in men who apply atrazine. They have 2,400 parts per billion atrazine in their urine. That's 24,000 times the atrazine that we're using in my laboratory. Imagine this, one of these guys could pee in a bucket. I could dilute their urine 24,000 times and I can use the atrazine in their urine that they're carrying in their bodies to chemically castrate and feminize 24,000 buckets of tadpoles each. At this stage, I started to think about things like environmental justice, as, and, and you'll see why later realizing that I have to be more than just a little boy who likes frogs. Does atrazine turn on aromatase the way that it does in, in, in 
frogs and fish, and frogs and fish that would cause vitiligenesis in early cases, development of eggs and the yolking of eggs. That's not going to happen in a mammal, in a human. In a human, we'd be concerned about breast cancer and prostate cancer. And, and I'll show you some data. With regards to prostate cancer, there's an 8.4 fold increase in prostate cancer in the men who work in their factories bagging atrazine. So almost a 10 times, 10 fold increase in prostate cancer. There's at least one study that shows that women, not who work in the factory, but who live in the area where their well water is contaminated with atrazine, those women are more likely to get breast cancer compared to women who live in the same community but don't drink their well water. What's more is we showed, and at least one other study, actually several other studies showed, that if you take human cancer cells, okay, in black, that don't normally express aromatase and make estrogen, if you give the cells atrazine, they'll start expressing aromatase and making estrogen. So the same mechanism that we've seen in fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and rats, no surprise to me, that same mechanism is functioning as active in humans. The significance of that is the following. Most breast cancers, and my colleagues who study cancer would say all breast cancers are estrogen dependent. The cell becomes damaged and then the estrogen receptor, once it, once it receives estrogen, will stimulate that damaged cell, that cancer cell to grow and to divide and ultimately to metastasize and spread throughout the body. That estrogen is produced during breast cancer because most women get breast cancer after menopause. That estrogen is actually produced by the cells that surround the breast cancer called fibroblasts and stimulates those cells to, to grow and turn into a tumor. In fact, the expression of aromatase around those cancer cells is so important in breast cancer that the number one treatment for breast cancer right now is a chemical called letrozole, which works by blocking aromatase action so that you don't produce estrogen, so that your breast cancer is not stimulated. That pharmaceutical, that drug letrozole has to fight it out with the number one chemical contaminant of drinking water, which does exactly the opposite of what letrozole does. And it turns out that the same company in the year that I discovered all this, Novartis Oncology on their website said that they offer treatments for cancers that range from breast cancer to leukemia, et cetera. So the same company that was giving us 80 million pounds of atrazine, the number one contaminant of drinking water, rainwater, et cetera, that same company was producing letrozole. So if you were living in the Midwest with breast cancer, taking letrozole to treat your breast cancer, that drug was fighting it out with a chemical made by the same company and it does exactly the opposite. You can imagine I got in trouble. I published a paper called The One-Stop Shop, Chemical Causes and Cures for Breast Cancer. Um, after that all came out, they changed their name to Syngenta. So Syngenta makes atrazine now, but not the breast cancer treatment drug. The significance of Syngenta though is that their production facility is in a place called San Gabriel, Louisiana, a community that's 80% black, um, low-income community. They have a pipe that flows directly into the Mississippi River. Turns out 1.2 million pounds of atrazine flow into the Gulf of Mexico every year. And, and as far as I know, nobody's studying the impact on wildlife. And it's in a community, it's through a community, much of which looks like this. It's a lot of production facilities and oil refineries there. And I bring that up because these are the top 13 cancers that you're gonna get in the United States. And red now, 11 out of 13, you're more likely to get if you're black. In addition, you're more likely to die from 13 out of 13 cancers if you're black. And I can show you similar data for Latinx individuals. The point being that my colleagues who study cancer say that less than 30% of cancer can be explained by genetics. So that when your doctor tells you that you're more likely to get breast cancer if your sister, your aunt, or somebody else in your family has had breast cancer, they're not telling you that you have bad genes. They're telling you that you've been exposed to the same crap in the environment as the rest of your family. What's more is, um, again, I'm just a little boy who likes frogs, but what's more is now realizing that combing for the cure, I mean, cure would be great, but what about prevention? And those cures that we research for cancer, with the exception of HeLa, aren't done on cells from black people or Latinx individuals. So that means that even if you find the cure, the people who are more likely to get 
and more likely to die from the cancer may very well not benefit from the cure that you get from cell lines that are not relevant to their condition. So I think that my interest in this aquatic organism has told me quite a bit about this aquatic organism. Because we start out in the amniotic fluid, we start out in an aquatic state. We use the same hormones, thyroid hormone, testosterone, estrogen. They're made the same way, they work the same way, they function, they have similar functions. And we now know that your children, should you choose to have them, will be exposed to over 300 synthetic chemicals before they leave the womb. And I would argue that one of my, that a, a fetus, a human fetus trapped in a contaminated amniotic fluid is not all that different than one of my tadpoles in a contaminated pond or contaminated aquarium of my laboratory. The most important thing about atrazine is we know what it does. For most of these chemicals that your children will be exposed to, we have no idea what they do at low levels, at low doses, like we do for atrazine. We do know, and I'm gonna show you a few studies that have impacted my perspective a great deal. They're not studies that I've done, but they're peer reviewed public studies and they're all on rats. And now let me tell you, I've told you why I went, why I studied frogs, because I'm just a little boy who likes frogs. I didn't start studying frogs to understand humans. I'm pretty sure, however, that people study, who study rats aren't little boys and girls who like rats. They're studying rats because they're trying to learn something about humans directly. And here's what we know about rats. Atrazine causes prostate and mammary cancer in rats. That's been published. Atrazine causes immune failure in rats. We've shown similar things in, in our amphibians. Atrazine causes, um, atrazine causes neural damage in rats that are exposed in utero. And the study that struck me the most, or several studies, is atrazine causes abortion when pregnant rats are exposed to atrazine because of the hormone balance imbalance that atrazine creates. Another, and, and that work was done by EPA laboratory. Another EPA laboratory showed that atrazine causes prostate disease. So if you're pregnant with a male, with a son, it's more likely to be born with prostate disease if you're exposed to atrazine. They're born with the prostate of an old man. If you are pregnant and don't abort, the daughters are born with impaired mammary development, so their breasts don't develop properly. And then when those rats grow up, their offspring have retarded growth and development because their mother is not able to feed them. So what, what, what really moves me, it's not my own work in this area, but the fact that this rat at the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. Again, this rat at the bottom never saw atrazine directly. This rat at the bottom with retarded growth and development was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. So when I think about my, grand, my potential grandchildren, your potential grandchildren, when I think about the fact that my daughter's kids, that your grandchildren, that my grandchildren may be affected by chemicals that we're using today. It makes me realize that I have a much bigger responsibility than, than just a little boy who likes frogs. Again, we don't do experiments on humans, but this is a study showing that if you get pregnant doing peat atrazine contamination time, then you're more likely to have a baby with birth defects. This is human data now, it's just correlation, but we've seen this experimentally. What I wanna point out in particular is this case control study of maternal residential atrazine exposure and male genital malformations. And I won't read to you all of this, but this paper, and I, and I um, just as a warning, there are graphic images coming up, because this paper showed that if you're exposed to atrazine and you're pregnant with a son, you're more likely to have a baby with hypospadias. That's where the urethra doesn't end all the way through the penis. If you're exposed to atrazine and you have a male child in utero, your male child is more likely to be born with cryptorchidism. That's where the testicles don't descend into the scrotum. And you're more likely to have a baby with micropenis. That's where the penis doesn't grow. And what strikes me about this study is that male genital development and growth depends on testosterone. So this is just correlation, but if you're exposed to atrazine, a chemical that knocks out testosterone, you have a baby that looks like it didn't have enough testosterone. What's more is all of these effects can be induced by estrogen levels that are too high and atrazine induces estrogen production in every animal that's been studied. And if you're pregnant and exposed to atrazine, you're more likely to have a male child 
that looks like it's been exposed to too much estrogen. What, what makes this even more um, interesting is that here's another paper published in 2020, okay? Prenatal exposure to atrazine induces cryptorchidism and hypospadias in mice. So here's again, mice with the decreased penis size after they're exposed to atrazine. Here's mice with, you can see one testicles here, one testicles there. Mice with cryptorchidism and low testosterone after atrazine exposure. And, and here's the data showing the low testosterone and low sperm count. So even though this stuff is correlation, that if you're exposed to atrazine, it's correlated with these types of effects, these same types of effects can be induced experimentally in mice and rodents that are exposed to atrazine. Part of the problem is that we, one, don't screen chemicals for endocrine disruption. There, there, there's no rule in the EPA. And the other part of the problem is even if we did, oftentimes toxicity is based on effects of a chemical on an adult white male. When we know that children and also people of color and, and who are more exposed to these chemicals are in much greater risk than an adult white male. The EPA has also not been very helpful. So the EPA over these last 20 years, I've interacted with them. They finally acknowledged that uh, my work has shown that atrazine causes problems. Um, but they also said, and this is an article from New Yorker Magazine, the EPA also said, quote, a monetary value is assigned to disease impairments and shortened lives and weighed against the benefits of keeping the chemical in use. So what they're saying is even once they have scientific data that a chemical is dangerous, it doesn't necessarily mean it will get banned because somebody makes money off of it. And in this case, um, what I'm showing you here is where corn goes. Atrazine is mostly used on corn. And what you'll notice is missing from this chart is food. We eat so little of the corn that we grow that it doesn't even show up. This feed is animal feed, not, not people food. We eat less than 2% of the corn that we grow. Atrazine increases corn yield by 1.2%. So we're using a chemical that causes all this damage to increase yield by 1.2% of a crop that we eat less than 2% of, while 20% of the world dies of starvation. So it's not about feeding the world, it's about the $100 million that farmers get for growing corn with atrazine. What's more is, this is a figure now showing the that 90% 90 of our agricultural workers are Latinx, so we're targeting a, a portion of the population. And then finally, what this figure shows is that California, for those of you who don't know, is the fifth largest economy in the world. And not because of tech or because of Hollywood, but because of agriculture. One in 10 jobs are in ag, 30% of the land is in ag. We produce 350 agricultural products and half of the United States' food, half of the food you eat in the US comes from California. As a result, we use more pesticides than any other state. And as I said, 90% of the workers are Latinas. What I'm putting now here in red, that's the 30% of the land. That's the top 10 counties for agriculture in California. These are the counties that make us the fifth richest country in the world, California alone. The numbers here now show the 30 poorest towns in California. So the people who make us the fifth largest economy in the world, that 90% Latinx population I showed you, those are the targets. Those are the ones who take that cost that the EPA talks about so that somebody can make money. The EPA says that it is unfortunate but not uncommon for registrants to sit on data. They're talking about atrazine. And what they're describing here, that in the descent says, science can be manipulated to serve certain agendas. All you can do is practice suspended disbelief. This is the EPA admitting that they know that the company lies about the dangers of atrazine. Again, I worked for them, so I know they have this information. At the same time, the EPA is, is not free, is not innocent. Here's an EPA report, notice the date, November 5th, 2020, where they released a draft biological evaluation of atrazine, cymosine, and propazine, two related compounds. And they admitted that atrazine is likely to adversely affect 54% of all species and 40% of all critical habitats. So the Environmental Protection Agency has admitted that atrazine is, is bad, yet in that same year, okay, you can see here the date of September 2020, 
EPA reapproves atrazine. So they reapproved atrazine knowing that it would affect 54% of all species and 40% of all critical habitats. And finally, I'll conclude as a result of speaking out, if you can imagine I've been attacked by the company, but the company says, this is a, a interview they gave with New Yorker Magazine in an article that was done about me and my work. The, EP, uh, the, the Syngenta says, I am troubled by a suggestion that we have ever tried to discredit anyone because I said they tried to discredit me. Our focus has always been on communicating the science and setting the record straight. They are troubled by the suggestion. And then here are secret notes that became public when they lost a $100 million lawsuit. Okay. Look at their number one goal under science was discredit Hayes. So not only have I called them out on it, they actually wrote down in a meeting that the idea was to discredit me, not to refute the science. They wrote, they made lists of things that they were gonna do to me. You can see here, family background, investigating my students, set a trap is my favorite. Somebody sat in a meeting and wrote down that they were planning to set a trap for me. And what's related to being a black scientist in much the same way that they attacked Rachel Carson as a woman for her defense of the environment. They chose things like you can see here, they did a social psychological profile. They chose to target me in specific ways that would make me doubt myself as an academic, as a person of color in academia. And we can talk more about that if you want. See, they decided I was paranoid, schizophrenic, narcissistic. Don't disrespect them, at least they got that part right. But all of this has come to make me realize that I can't follow uh, the philosophy I was taught by my PhD advisor was don't be an advocate, let the science speak for itself. You publish these papers and the science will speak for itself. My mom asking me how important is that article, Barnes and Noble never heard of it, um, made me realize first and foremost that science doesn't speak for itself and you have to speak up for it. One of the troubles is trying to navigate that in the real world. Again, this is more associated with me being black and being a scientist. This is a meme that circulated about me. Um, it's claiming that I said that the government is intentionally putting atrazine in the water to turn black men gay. I've never said, you know, I've said you're more likely exposed if you're a person of color or if you're low income. I've talked about what atrazine does, but I've never made such political comments as claimed here. And then there are other times when it, it being a person of color has really stood out. So this is an announcement of the most prestigious award by the black queer community uh, that was awarded to me and, and things like that type of recognition and being able to connect with, with my community has been very important for me. And finally, I'm gonna end with uh, a quote. This is a quote from my mother's homegoing and one that I think that we can all, some thoughts we can all benefit from. And I'll end there and I'll take your questions and comments. Thank you very much, Dr. Hayes. That was wonderful. Um, we are pleasure. now going to turn it over to team number nine, who has been monitoring some questions. Um, so team nine, you guys can go ahead and start your questions. All right. I think my teammates are not here today, so it is just going to be me. Um, but we have some questions lined up. And the first one is, okay. is aromatase present in most wildlife species, or is it specific to amphibians? It's, it's in all vertebrates and it's regulated the same way in all vertebrates. So it's, um, in humans, it's complex because aromatase, the gene itself is regulated differently depending on which body part. So in humans, we have aromatase in your ovaries. Okay, so that's, that's the main source of estrogen that circulates in your blood. But there's also aromatase in the brain. There's aromatase in fat. As I said, there's aromatase in fibroblasts that, that occur around breasts tumors, um, and I may have left off. Oh, and there's aromatase in bone. So, but it's regulated differently in all those places in humans, but in the ovaries, it's regulated the same way in all animals. Yeah, that, that big mechanism with the PDE that I showed you. All right. Uh, the next question is, why are commercially provided frogs more resistant to developing ovaries? That's a good question. Um, so some of it may be just by chance. It just be, it might be that there's like this variability in the wild. And so the animals that they initially collected for their colony just happen to be from the resistant end of things. That's probably less likely. The other possibility is that um, 
if they're grown in laboratories where there's atrazine contamination in the water, then there might be selection for animals that are resistant to maintain the colony. And we've shown that you can select for resistance or sensitivity in just two or three generations. And two or three generations by selectively breeding animals, you can, you can select for either end of that spectrum. All right. Uh, the next question is, does atrazine have significant effects on female frogs? And do atrazine-exposed males have trouble adjusting to their changes in sex? That's that's an, another excellent question. So I've had a graduate student trying to answer part of that question. And there's a spectrum among frogs that are ones that are really resistant, like I said. Um, then there are ones that just completely become female and are able to reproduce. There are ones in the middle. Middle, for example, that might have some, quote, female parts and some male parts. So we have frogs that might have testes, but then they have an oviduct. So that would be the equivalent of somebody with testicles and a uterus. Um, we have frogs that look male, but they have female hormone levels, and they behave as if they're females. So they show homosexual population, um, and, and, and that's complicated because they don't reproduce, but they also tend to um, distract other males that are trying to reproduce. And so I have a student who's actually studying those animals in the middle. Um, I don't know that it, it's, it causes any difficulties. We do have a condition, by the way, um, where <clears throat> male frogs will grow eggs in their testes. And, and, and that might very well be painful, I don't know. So they, they yolk up big eggs in their testes, but there's no oviduct, so there's no fallopian tube, if you will. To take the egg away. So in that case, it might be physically uncomfortable. But otherwise, I, I wouldn't, I, I don't think it would be physically uncomfortable for them in any one of the states. All right. Um, our next question, is atrazine used in herbicide and pesticide cocktails? And are there other herbicides that when used with atrazine can cause even greater feminization of males? Another excellent question. Um, so atrazine can be sold as a mixture. So there's some compounds like uh, this one called Bicep that's a mixture of atrazine and um, an herbicide called Metolachlor. But even if you're using atrazine directly, most farmers use it in combination with five, six, or even more chemicals. And it's an excellent question because we have studied this. So we published a paper a few years back where we combined, actually we published several, published several papers where we combined um, uh, pesticides <clears throat> in, a, in a way that they would be used <clears throat> on, a, on a real farm. And we show that there are these unpredictable group effects of pesticides. So it's not just additive, you can add up and, and <clears throat> see what would happen uh, and predict what would happen. Um, the question about combining feminizing pesticides is one that we're working on now. So as I said, in Congaree National Park, Animals are exposed to atrazine, which increases estrogen production, but they're also exposed to ethanyl estradiol, which is itself a very stable estrogen. And so we're now doing experiments to try to understand um, that combination of two feminizing effects. And my guess is when you have something like ethanyl estradiol, which is much more potent than even the natural estrogen, that that effect will swamp out any effect of atrazine, that that ethanyl estradiol will be so potent. It's, in our first study, we're showing it's it's like 10 times more potent than the natural estrogen. And that's why they use it, right? So for birth control pill, they use a synthetic estrogen specifically because it stays in your body longer. Like compounds like Depo-Provera, the, the birth control shot that you get, that's a synthetic progestin. That, that can stay in your body for months. Whereas natural progesterone, you know, circulates and within hours it's out of your body. But they, they do that on purpose so that it stays there for longer. All right. Our next question is, how does atrazine enter the organism system? Does it have to be ingested or just touched? Another excellent, you should all come work in my lab. So another excellent question. In the case of frogs, the tadpoles are living in the water. So they're, they're drinking it in because they, you know, they have gills. So they're taking in water. It's also coming across their skin. For humans, <clears throat> I did, um, yeah, I didn't show you the data. Oh, well, I did show you one of the data sets for what's coming out in human urine. For people who work in the fields and the people who work in their factories, most of the exposure is to inhalation and dermal absorption. So they're breathing it in, it's coming across the skin. Um, unless you work in a factory or work on a farm, your exposure is to drinking water. So you would ingest it 
but there is some, in, in Australia, for example, they use atrazine and cymosine in swimming pools to kill the algae. So you literally have little kids swimming in this chemical that I just talked about. All right. Um, our next question is, does the spectrum of effects that atrazine has on frogs depend on the level of, of exposure or on the genetic basis of the frog? I, another excellent question. I suspect both. Because you, you saw in that big graph where the, where the blue went to red, there's some frogs that just are resistant. They don't respond to the same level of estrogen in the water. We would predict that they would show that same um, variability in their response to atrazine and to other estrogens. So it's, it's a combination of what they're exposed to in terms of the concentration, the duration of exposure, the timing of exposure, it's also important. But there's, we believe there's a genetic basis for this resistance. Because as I said, <clears throat> as I said, you can select for it. So, so we can breed resistant frogs with sensitive frogs over two generations and change their sensitivity. So we know that there's a genetic basis for it. All right. Um, the next question is, how does atrazine lead to permanent feminization even after it's metabolized? Again, another excellent question. For a lot of hormone effects, there's something called critical periods. Um, so, to, so to give you an example, um, to give you an example in humans, whether or not you have a labia, if you're um, an XX individual ovaries versus a testis, because you know, the, um, <clears throat> versus a scrotum, because you know the scrotum is fused labia, right? So, if you are an XX individual with ovaries, your your labia don't fuse; they develop into your the lips of the vagina. Whereas, if you are an XY individual with testes, what would have been your labia fuse and becomes a scrotum, and then your testicles descend into it. Does that all make sense? So that's a permanent effect. Testosterone causes the fusion of labia to develop a scrotum. If you take the testosterone away later in life, the scrotum doesn't go away. That's a permanent change, okay? So the same thing in frogs, when estrogen causes the gonad to become an ovary, that's permanent, it can't be reversed. Or it's just like um, breast development. So if you reach puberty and you're exposed to estrogen, you grow breasts. If you remove the ovaries and the estrogen later in life, the breasts don't go away. That's a, that's a permanent, uh, what's called an organizational effect of that hormone. So there's some effects like the development of ovaries that won't go away, even if you remove the atrazine. That's a permanent effect. Whereas there are other effects like the decreased testosterone and sperm count. If you treat adults and sperm count goes down, if you take the atrazine away, the sperm count comes back. So that's what's called an activational effect. Does that make sense? Did that answer the question? Okay. Perfectly. Um, and then along the same vein, is there a way to reduce the effects of atrazine while someone is being exposed? So again, another excellent question. One of the projects we're doing right now, um, I think I can talk about this. So there's a company that's produced this chemical. It's a catalyst. And supposedly that chemical can get rid of contaminants in the environment. Okay. So, so this chemical would take ethyl estradiol or atrazine and eat it up and convert it into a non-harmful compound. So we just got a contract with this company to study just that. So remember that estrogen turned all of those animals into females that made them grow ovaries. So the idea is that if we had treated that water with this chemical first, then it would remove that effect. It would, it would basically destroy that chemical. So that's one of the ways that, that potentially you can um, get rid of the effects in the environment. And that's first right now we're testing the chemical itself, right? Because the chemical itself, it might get rid of estrogen, but it might do other nasty things to amphibians. You may have heard, for example, that when there's an oil spill, there's a chemical that they use to eat up the oil. Well, it turns out the chemical that eats up the oil is it's maybe more damaging to fish and wildlife than the oil itself. So that's the first thing we're trying to figure out is to make sure that this chemical, which may very well eat up estrogen, we first have to make sure that the chemical itself doesn't have its own harmful effects. All right. Um, what kind of consequences can result from eating an organism like fish that is exposed to atrazine? And could there be any health consequences of eating corn treated with atrazine? So also an excellent question. In this case for atrazine, it's not in the corn and it's not in the fish. It's very water soluble. So animals that ingest it can get rid of it very quickly. The danger it becomes for the animal eating it is that if you're exposed 
day in, day out, over and over and over again, then there's, you've essentially bathed in it. So there's no danger to my knowledge. Um, although I've read it can be in milk, um, but there's no danger of getting it in corn or in animals. That's not true of other pesticides. There are other pesticides that um, are fat soluble, for example, and that can bioaccumulate. So insects die from it, but then something eats the insect, you know, fish eats the insect, and then an uh, eagle eats the fish. And so as you go up the food chain or up the food web, so to speak, to higher trophic levels, then you can actually accumulate the toxin by eating contaminated um, organisms. That's not the case with AstraZeneca. Um, the next question is, how do the female rats self-abort when they're affected by atrazine? I, so I think what's happened there is progesterone is required to maintain the pregnancy. Again, progesterone is also a portmanteau. It means progestational hormone. Gestation is pregnancy. So the steroid that um, is necessary for you, for example, to not have contractions in the middle of your pregnancy is progesterone. And so I think what atrazine does is when they're exposed and they're pregnant is it upsets that hormone balance. Typically estrogen is associated with the end of the pregnancy. Estrogen makes you more sensitive to the hormones that cause contractions, for example. So I think what's happening with atrazine is you're shifting that balance so that progesterone goes down and estrogen starting to go up. So it induces like a, a miscarriage, essentially. Um, are the mechanisms of atrazine similar to antiandrogens used in male to female horm hormone therapy? No, the mechanism's not the same. So atrazine, atrazine, well, one, I should say atrazine does lots of things. I've talked to you about the aromatase induction, but atrazine also affects other enzymes that lowers androgen production, for example. Um, but no, it's not the same. The antiandrogens that are used in human health is um, they block the androgen receptor. There are other compounds that will reduce androgen production. Those may also be used as well, but those don't work by the same mechanism as atrazine, to my knowledge. They work by um, further, down, uh, further back in the biochemistry, they work by reducing androgen production. They don't make as much. And then again, the others work by blocking the androgen receptor. And we're using some of those in frogs as well. They do the same thing in frogs that they do in humans. Um, could we breed frogs to be atrazine resistant by using the same selection that's possibly used in commercial sale? Um, we have, we've done that in my lab. The problem is that if you have hard selection for something like that, then you lose a lot of other genetic variability. So that's one of the things that we worry about for GMO crops, right? If you're, if you're selecting crops that are herbicide resistant, let's say Roundup ready crops, then you're losing a lot of other genes that might be important. You're losing a lot of diversity, for example, that might be important for drought resistance or that might be important for nutritional content or um, you know, some other aspect of corn or whatever product you would want. So you could do that for frogs and you could do that for corn, but then you've lost all your other genetic variables. All right. Um, you mentioned earlier that atrazine can be found in milk. So we're wondering how would this occur? Uh, because it's water, highly water soluble and, and you know, milk is mostly water, like, like any liquid. So if, if, if you have an atrazine contaminated mother whose blood is contaminated with atrazine, the blood plasma is producing the water that goes into the milk. So that's why you see it in the milk. There are other, there are other pesticides as well and, and drugs. I mean, of course, you know this, that like um, human individuals that are on prescription drugs or that are on recreational drugs or that even drink alcohol, you know that that can be passed on to the baby through the milk. All right. Um, does atrazine also cause immune system suppression in frogs and animals other than rats? 
Okay. Okay, sorry. I think we lost the connection. I missed the in the yeah. okay, there I don't you know are. Chat. Did you? Oh, <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> Okay, Catherine, do you want to re-ask that last question? All right. I think the last question we left off on was, does atrazine also cause immune system suppression in frogs and animals other than rats? Um, yes. So we've seen immunosuppression in frogs. Um, other people have seen it in rats, the, the immune suppression. Um, I don't know. I don't know that there are any, stu any studies that have shown it directly in humans. But it definitely occurs in rats. It definitely occurs in, in frogs. All right. Um, and then the next question, if you are comfortable sharing, how has being a person of color affected how you navigated the media coverage you received because of your research on atrazine? Yeah, and I mentioned, you know, the company in terms of their strategies targeted that, that to some extent. So for example, you know, there would be comments about, you know, I don't dress right, or I don't speak right, or um, there were also lots of um, anti-gay speech about, you know, my sexuality, and um, it, so it was very targeted. And, and as I showed you in their list, they had listed, you know, that they paid a lot of money to do the psychological profile. Um, I think that combined with, you know, I showed a few slides at the end, trying to navigate with the broader community about my work and about, um, because I think, I think there are some, you know, environmental justice, I think there's some very clear environmental justice issues, but then to have that converted into, Hayes says there's a conspiracy to make black men gay, you know, being able to deal with, with that, you know, with my work being twisted that way and trying to communicate um, with the black community. Um, in some ways it gives me an advantage in other ways there's a disadvantage um, which again, we can, we can delve into as deeply as people want. Um, and then part of it's just, just, you know, being a person of color, being a black scientist, you know, as I always tell my students, if you're a person of color, for example, and you go to a conference, being a person of color can, can, can be the greatest thing ever or the worst thing ever. And I say that because if I go to a conference and give a talk, everybody remembers me. Because you know, oftentimes I'm the only black person at the conference. So either they're gonna remember, wow, there's a black guy who gave a really great talk, or they're gonna remember like, oh, there's a black guy who gives the awful talks. So no matter what, right, it, it's, it's, people are gonna remember. Like nobody's gonna forget you as a black man speaking at a, at a conference. Um, but that could work to your favor or it can work to your disfavor. And, and Syngenta played on that a lot. Of, um, and I think also that a lot of the publicity was because of that, was because of, um, you know, because of who I was and, and because it made it more difficult to just go, yeah, there's that guy, just ignore that talk. You know? All right, um, sort of in a similar vein, how did the conflicting interests of companies like Syngenta play into your advocacy against atrazine? That was a hard one too, because I think, I think in general, there's this, you know, like I showed the quote from my PhD advisor, like, oh, let the science speak for itself. There's this, idea that if you become an advocate somehow, or if you become an activist somehow, that your objectivity is compromised. And I don't think that's the case at all. And I, you know, I, I really think that as scientists, we should step up more, we should come out of the ivory tower more. Um, you know, imagine if ecologists didn't speak up against deforestation, or imagine if meteorologists or people who studied weather didn't speak up regarding climate change. I think we, we have to speak up and be more. And I think the 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 problem of of science not addressing the public and not being in the public and not being in the public of mind, we've just witnessed it. We witnessed it with COVID, with people now were for the first time watching science unfold before their eyes. What is COVID? Where did it come from? How does it spread? How does the vaccine work? MRNA, you know, the, the things that I've tried to deal with on social media. That, that people, you know, that even my parents say for that matter, you know, my parents aren't scientists. And, you know, some of the things that, that people have thrown out, um, you know, some of the comments about masks and about Fauci and, 
you know, if people were more educated about how science works, if people understood more that when a scientist says that a, that a true scientist would never say, I have proven, a true scientist would say, well, the evidence suggests and supports the following. If people understood that that's the way that you speak, when you have hypotheses and ideas as a scientist, then I think we wouldn't have had the kinds of trouble that we've had in dealing with COVID. When people say, oh, Fauci doesn't know what he's doing. He keeps changing his mind. Well, no, as you get more information, then your advice and your recommendations change because now you have more information. If people understood the difference between mRNA and DNA, we wouldn't have people fearing that an mRNA vaccine is changing their genes somehow. You know, So we have to take on, especially as people of color, you know, some of the arguments that I that I get in with even my family members is, you know, they talk about a mistrust of the vaccine and then they immediately will bring up, well, what about Tuskegee? What about your own work? You know, clearly pharmaceutical companies lie and that's true. But how do you get the, the, the general public to be able to weed through that and figure out, well, what is evidence and what's just anecdotal stories of, you know, I don't know. It's a tough one, but it's, it's one especially for you young people to think about. All right, uh, absolutely. And then the next question is, do you know of any scientific evidence the FDA cited in support of reapproving atrazine? No, I, I, you know, I think, well, the EPA is the one who did the approval. And, and I think it's summed up in that statement that they made to the press that a monetary value is assigned to diseases, impairments, and shortened lives. So, so what the EPA is saying is it's not just about the science, right? Um, you can weigh that against the phrase, you know, let the science speak for itself. The EPA is saying, well, even if the science speaks for itself, we're evaluating even more. We're evaluating the fact that somebody makes money on this, on this compound. So, so, so there's no evidence in favor of atrazine not being normal, harmful, or in favor of atrazine being helpful to human health. The, the decision is that the monetary value of atrazine outweighs the costs associated with human exposure and human health problems. Building on that, is there any progress in getting the FDA and EPA to regulate the use of atrazine? And in the last few decades, have you noticed any change in how the FDA and EPA operate based on changes in elected officials? Yeah, it's definitely, uh, you know, because the head of the EPA is appointed by the president. And, and, and of course, I've said this many times, the president, when, when they're running for office, is not going to, you know, the first presidential primary is in Iowa. You're not going to go to Iowa and say, oh, I'm going to appoint somebody that's going to regulate atrazine, which is, you know, Iowa's entire economy is based on corn. You're not going to say that, right? Um, the other complications are that, well, I mean, one, the main one is money, right? At the 1.2% increase in corn yield gets translated into $100 million, literally, for farmers. It's also complicated by the fact that corn is used to grow, it's used to produce ethanol. So it's tied up with the clean renewable fuel lobby, which of course, I mean, it makes no sense, right? And if you really wanted to make ethanol, you wouldn't grow corn. You'd grow like these big yams or whatever, like they grow in Brazil. You wouldn't grow this six foot tall thing that produces two years of corn. So as I point out many times, it's not like somebody sat by and said, gee, we need to make more ethanol. That decision was made because somebody said, gee, what the hell are we going to do with all this corn? Right? So <laughs> that's that's so it's tied up with that. So there are no positive effects of atrazine other than the monetary effects and, and the tie with the um, renewable fuel industry. So the 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 changes I've seen, not really. Um, industry has a big role in the EPA's decision. So, in other words, there are oftentimes people from the chemical companies are sitting on the boards and making those decisions along with the EPA. Um, that's continued um, through all, all the administrations. It was maybe worse in, in Bush and, and let's not even talk about Trump's administration. Um, and the regulation, no chemicals ever been regulated by the EPA for being an endocrine disruptor. And in fact, no agrochemicals ever been banned by the EPA. DDT wasn't banned by the EPA. EPA. So it would be unprecedented if that happened. Um, individual states could do it. So I know atrazine is now regulated in Alaska, Hawaii, um, 
and, and one other place that skips my mind. Um, and it's already listed under a state protocol in California. So it, it and, and Wisconsin also regulates atrazine. So it will probably come state by state rather than by US EPA. And then uh, someone noted that after you made the connection towards the end of the presentation to certain conspiracy theorists, uh, they were shocked at how research could be distorted into political purposes. So the question is, how is science misappropriated for politics and argument? All the time. I mean, we, we just watched a president misrepresent science, right? With Trump and COVID. Um, everything becomes political, right? And even with COVID, right? The balance became you know, how much money are we losing? How much is the economy being hurt versus what is the risk to our citizens, right? So you can imagine that th the way things have opened up now, that decision was not just based on, oh, now it's safe to go outside and be in crowds. That decision was based on, we can't afford to have restaurants and businesses closed any longer. I mean, that those decisions, Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, for example, within the first couple of months of COVID, we lost a quarter of a billion dollars because nobody was going to basketball games, nobody or whatever sport was happening then. Um, you know, scientists weren't bringing in overhead for their research, parking, I mean, nobody was parking on campus. So those, those decisions are, you know, not just based on the health and health of people. It's, it's a balance, just like the EPA said, you know, the harm is balanced with how much money people can make if we keep them in use. And when the harm is, is the burden is on low income, first generation immigrant people that don't have the same voice um, then you can imagine they would you know the, mm -hmm. the balance is against them because they don't have the political power and the money to do anything else absolutely and building on that do you think there needs to be a larger advocacy movement from both scientists and non-scientists absolutely 100 percent. there needs to be a way to fund these kinds of things also that doesn't involve the company. There needs to be, you know, all companies should have to pay some kind of tax if they're making chemicals, and that should go into a pool that's objectively regulated by academic scientists and government officials, and that money go out with, with no ties to the company to do the kind of research that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And then the next question is, considering all the results that you've gained so far, what do you think is an important topic for further research? Mm, um, well, of course, I'm going to say the stuff that we're doing. One is to get a better idea of the impact that this has had on, in the real world. So we've done, obviously, some field studies and things. and um, But the two the studies like we're doing in South Carolina and in the place at the golf course will give us a better idea of what, what's really happening. Um, and also, I think, better understanding of molecular events and better understanding of how this translates to human-related effects. Um, all those things need to happen. All right, perfect. And the last thing is not exactly a question, but a lot of the students noted in the document that they wanted me to thank you, especially for your storytelling, your research and your advocacy. Um, it was an incredibly enlightening and inspiring presentation. And we really do want to thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Well, and, and if any of you are ever at Berkeley, let me know. I'd be happy to show you around and, and hopefully see you in my class. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Hayes. Um, let's all give him a very big round of applause. Thank you.